Would you like to say Grace? Oh, uh, well, uh, Greg's Jewish dad. You know that. You're telling me Jews don't pray, honey? Unless you have some objection. No, 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 no. No, I'd love to. Pam, come on. It's not like I'm a rabbi or something. I <laughs> said Grace and many a dinner table. It's... Okay. Oh... Dear God, thank you. You are such a good God to us, a, a kind and gentle and accommodating God. And we thank you, oh sweet, sweet Lord of hosts, for the smorgasbord you have so aptly laying at our table this day and each day by day day by day by day oh dear lord three things we pray to love thee more dearly to see thee more clearly to follow thee more nearly day by day by day amen amen oh greg that was lovely thank you greg that was interesting too <laughs> rev students how are we doing good if uh that hopefully you guys enjoyed that um it's one of my uh, favorite uh, movie scenes about prayer, uh, right up there with Talladega Nights and sweet six pound, seven ounce uh, baby Jesus, so small yet still omnipotent. Um, just, just some, some really uh, good stuff there. But, uh, but hey, I, I'm glad you're here. We are kicking off a series uh, called Thoughts and Prayers, and just like uh, in that video, it is about uh, prayer. And the reason uh, I wanted to show a, a silly, funny uh, video like that is uh, because I feel like if we're being honest, we probably related to that at some level, right? We've been at some uh, family holiday uh, get together, and we all have that family member whose their job is to pray for the the Thanksgiving meal, the Christmas meal, whatever it is, and it is a little bit extra, right? Like they put a little bit of sauce on their prayer, right? You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's just got a little bit of sprinkle to it. Uh, and so just like in, in that one, or I may, maybe for you, like that's, that is the only time you pray. You, you, maybe your family instilled a rhythm in you, and be, before a meal, you begin uh, a meal with prayer, and that is a regular part of your rhythm. Uh, this series is called Thoughts and Prayers. If you've never heard that before, it's a very uh, popular saying specifically by people who have uh, influence and positions of power, specifically when something bad happens. Uh, recently, there is a tragedy uh, at an elementary school in Texas, and if you went on to social media, what you would have seen is many people feeling the need to comment the phrase, hey, our thoughts and prayers are with them. And while that is not, not bad, I'm not saying that there is anything wrong uh, with that. Uh, what I am saying is that there is something uh, more to what God has for us in prayer than simply sending out thoughts and prayer, simply sending out positive vibes, uh, simply praying before a meal. There is so much more that God has for us. And a lot of times I feel like when it comes to the topic of prayer, we believe if we, kind of like in that video, if we just said the right words, or if we just made it sound good enough, then maybe God will respond better, or people will think uh, better of us. So, you know, uh, there's three kind of phrases for it. There are fancy words, there are formal words, and then there's also fake words when it comes to prayer. Maybe that's somewhere where you find yourself, right? You have this eloquent prayer, you know, uh, are you, maybe that's what you're familiar with of just, oh dear Jesus, great Lord, please bless 
uh, all the peoples and all the things, and it's just this real extravagant and real eloquent. It's, it's fancy and it's formal, and a lot of times uh, it can be fake, and it doesn't really have a lot of meaning behind it, and the people praying don't mean a whole lot by it. And, and here, is, here is the problem that that can create for us, and here is why we wanted to, to talk about it. When we get prayer wrong, we begin to go to God for stuff than to go to God for him. We begin to go to God for stuff than to go to God for him. We begin to treat God kind of like a genie. Uh, when I growing up, my relation to a genie was Aladdin, the cartoon. Uh, everyone in here seen the cartoon version of Aladdin, hopefully. Uh, the live action version came out recently. Anyone seen that? A few people. Uh, anyways, well, apparently you guys don't like Disney and don't like Aladdin and you, you don't like Genie. But I'm going to tell my story anyways. So, uh, but I, I love Genie. Genie was great. Genie was funny. Uh, and he had the special ability of granting three wishes. And it could be anything that you wanted, right? And a lot of times I feel like that's how we treat God. When it comes to prayer, when it comes to our relationship with God, God is a genie in a bottle and we are just rubbing it and we're saying, God, I, I, you know what? I know I did not study for this test, but God, please give me knowledge that I didn't prepare for. God, please help me get a grade that I don't deserve on this test right now. Please, oh Lord, oh great God, I will start going to church every Wednesday and Sunday if you just help me, right? A lot of our prayers feel a little bit like that. And maybe it's not to pay, pass a test. Maybe there's just this boy or there's just this girl that you're like, and if God would just make them fall in love with you and, and like you and be your boyfriend and be your girlfriend, then everything would be great. Maybe for you it's to get on the sports team or to make the position or to make varsity or whatever it is that you want. God is the means to the end of it. He is the genie in the bottle. The, the problem with that is what happens when we don't get what we want. The problem with that, menta that mentality is what happens when the thing that we're wanting, the thing that we're praying for doesn't come through the way that we're asking for it. And let me take it a step further. What happened when it's something that really matters? And I'm not trying to downplay any of those things uh, I've already said, but what about when it's something that is just so important? What about when it is a family member who is sick and you are leaning in and you're, you're asking God to do something about it and he doesn't? What if your, your family feels like it's falling apart and you're asking God to do something about it and it doesn't seem like he is? What happens then? What, what do we do with our, our God genie in a bottle when we don't get what we want? The, the, the reason that we wanted to, to spend some time to talk about this and to answer some questions for you is because I believe God has so much for you in prayer than just uh, being a genie in a bottle and, and granting whatever wish uh, is on your mind at the moment. We want to help answer questions like, what do we do when we're praying and it just feels like God isn't there? What, 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 does God even hear my prayers? Or how do I even pray? Like, how do I, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do this? Is, it, is there a way to do this that is better than other ways? And so we wanted to spend some time with you guys because we believe that God has so much more for you uh, in that. And so we're going to be looking at a couple of people, uh, different people in scripture today uh, that wrote about how they connected with God. Uh, the first person we're going to be looking at is uh, King David. If you don't know who King David is, he's the person who the Bible says is the God, the man after God's own heart. Uh, he was uh, the king of all of God's people, and he did uh, many, many great things. And in his uh, writings, he wrote most of the book of Psalms, if you're familiar with that. And he would just write and, about what he was thinking, about what he was feeling. 
and he would just begin to write, and I, I want you to read some of the things that he says, and I'm, I, I hope you can uh, get something from it. Psalm verse 145, verse 17, it says, the Lord is righteous in all of his ways and kind in all of his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He also hears their cries and saves them. See, I feel like our first response when we read a passage like that is, is we think about ourselves. We're like, hey, there's been a time where I have called on God. And, and that scripture is saying that if you call on God, he's going to respond. He's going to, to fulfill the desires. But that hasn't been my experience. And uh, the author, David there, makes the distinction. It says, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. And that word truth uh, is also used as the word uh, honesty or honestly. And specifically in this passage when it's talking about prayer, it's talking about coming to God from an honest place. What David found out is that more than a particular set of phrases or words, how he approached God Approaching God in honesty and in truthfulness was foundational for him to be near to God, to feel God's presence, to feel God close to him. And if you think about it, that's true for all of your relationships as well. Aren't the people that you're closest to the people who you're the most open and honest with? The people who really know you? The, the people who, who, who know the good and who know the bad? I think one of the most crippling things for relationships uh, is when, when they're fake. When, when people don't really know you, when you don't actually let people in, when you pretend to be a certain way uh, just to try and appease uh, people around you because it is so crippling. It, it robs you of all the encouragement that people would give you. It robs you of all the kind words they would share for you. It robs you of every celebration that someone has for you because deep down in your inside, you would say, they wouldn't actually say that if they actually knew me. And you automatically invalidate all the things of the people who God have put around you. You would say, they, they, they wouldn't want to be close to me. They wouldn't want to be near me if they really knew me. And that's why I hide, and that's why I deflect, and that's why I'm not honest, and that's why I'm not open, and that's why people don't really know me. And can I tell you something, students? God knows. God knows. He knows the real you. There is no place you can go hide. There is no mask you can put on. God knows, and he still wants to connect with you. He still wants to draw near to you, and he wants you to draw near to him. You see, what, what David found out is that honest prayers are greater than fancy prayers. You know, we, we listened to that uh, video earlier, and, and all the things he said, and he had big words, and it sounded so great, and it sounded uh, spiritual, but based off of what David's saying, that coming to him in truthfulness, coming to him in an honest place, being real when you come to God. That is what God moves, and that is what God responds to. If you look back at the, the verse in Psalm 145, he says he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. And this fear isn't like afraid. It's not like those who are cowering in a corner, scared of what God's going to do next. It's actually the word, same word we would use as reverence. It is understanding your place in response to his place. It is understanding how small you are compared to how big he is and responding properly to that. He is so much bigger. He is so much more powerful. And when our response to that is honesty and truthfulness, 
we begin to draw close to him, and in response, God draws close to us. Does that mean that the answer is always yes? No, it doesn't. The answer isn't always yes, but it does mean when we're coming from a place of honesty that not only does he hear us, but he moves and responds to us. And this, this was a thing in Jesus' time too, if we fast forward a little bit, Jesus is teaching his disciples and uh, he, he's calling out some inconsistencies he sees specifically in the area of prayer. And so we'll look at Matthew uh, 6, verse 7. It says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. You see, the the Gentiles, these are the non-Jewish people in that area, they had, uh, there was Gentile believers and there was also uh, Gentiles who believed in uh, Greek gods and and other gods and, and they would have these long, eloquent, drawn out prayers that sounded so fancy and sounded so great and had many big words and people were impressed with them and you'd listen to them and you're like, that person sounds so smart and that person sounds so wise. I bet they know God so much better than I do. I should listen to what they have to say and Jesus is saying, no, don't, don't be like them. They are throwing up words, and he says something specific. He says that they are empty. Can I, can I tell you what uh, empty words means? It means they don't have any substance. They don't have any value. They don't mean anything, and God is not going to respond to them. He says, don't, don't be like that. And if we're being honest, that's, that's where a lot of us probably find ourselves right now. More often, the times that we are praying, we're kind of throwing up a rehearsed prayer. We're, we're throwing up some rhythm that we've been in. We are not coming from a place of honesty and authenticity. We just want to be heard. And so what, what, if you're taking notes, what I want you to, to know as we begin to dive in where God has us today is how you pray is more important than what you say. How you pray is more important than what you say. And we're going to get a lot more into how we pray next week, and I'm really uh, excited for you guys. We're going to have some things for you to do, for you to to grow and to to actually participate in prayer. So please be back next week for that, uh, because you do not want to miss that. But there is something foundational that we have to get through and get to first for us to to grasp and get our minds around this prayer thing. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, uh, if you didn't know, Jesus had a brother, grew up with Jesus in the same household, and uh, two of the Gospels would actually say that James grew up and didn't believe that Jesus was who he said he was. Like, he grew up in the same house as Jesus, and he, he didn't believe that Jesus was God. You know, and, and maybe some of you can relate. You have brothers and sisters, and if your brother or sister was like, hey, I'm actually God in the flesh, I'm not sure if you uh, realize that, you would be like, hmm, I don't know. I know some things. I've seen some things. I, I have some doubts. And so uh, this is where James was. And so he, he, he would grow up not being a believer until something changed. The Apostle Paul would say he encountered the resurrected Jesus. So imagine the trauma of seeing your brother die, be crucified unjustly. You know, the, the, the scriptures talk about Jesus coming back and engaging with the disciples, but we don't see uh, a, the story of him re-engaging with his family. I just imagine what that would be like, but I'm sure it was a powerful moment because this was the moment for, for James where he went from not believing his entire life that Jesus was who he said he was to believing it. And so G- James actually becomes one of the foundational pillars of the New Testament church. He ends up dying later on in his life, being crucified, saying that Jesus was who he said he was. And in his letter Uh, to the church in James chapter 4, this is what he says. He says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, 
and he will draw near to you. I find it interesting that both David and and James uh, are using this idea. There's this idea that they're trying to communicate of the nearness of God. That, That not only can we have a relationship with God, but God can be near. And I feel like most of us in this room would probably say that's something that we desire. Actually, the, the nearness of God is actually the reason that we have doubts, is actually the reason that sometimes we don't pray, is actually uh, the reason we don't follow him as closely as we should, because sometimes he just doesn't feel near, and we, we don't know what to do with that. If we're being honest, if this can be an honest place, that's probably where a lot of our, us find ourselves sometimes. And the argument that James is presenting here, I want you to see this, is that there is a direct correlation between the nearness of God and our submission to him. He starts that, that passage, submit yourselves therefore to God. He says, draw near to him and he will draw near to you. There's a direct correlation between the nearness of God and the submission of God. What, what we need to realize is that our nearness problem is actually a submission problem. Our nearness problem to God, the reason that God doesn't feel near, the reason that God feels distance, the reason uh, we're, we're not sure, we just can't feel his presence, isn't actually a nearness problem. It's a submission problem. What, what does that mean? Submission means that it's his way over our way. And the reason I think we have such a hard problem with that is because we don't really believe what he's saying. He says he he wants the best for us. He says he has so many good things for us. And when, when we look around, we look at all the things of the world, and we believe that if we really follow Jesus, like we're asked to, if we really did the things that God asked us to do, that we would miss out on all the things that the world has for us. I often uh, use the story of the, the father in, in the Gospels, Jesus is teaching a parable, and he said, what good father, when their son comes to them and asks them for bread, would give them a stone? And I'm a logical person, so I'm thinking, not, not a good father. I'm not, has anyone in here experienced that? You're hungry, it's dinner time, uh, you smell bread. Maybe, does anyone have a homemade bread machine? Has anyone ever smelled homemade bread filling, the aroma of homemade bread filling the house and you're just smelling it and then you get to your dinner table and there's a rock, right? Like not, not a good deal. He's saying, what kind of parent would do that? And what he's saying there, he says, I am so much more of a good father than any earthly father, than any earthly parent ever could be. And if I'm offering you good things, how much more can I do for you? And I believe so many of us get caught up being worried about missing out on what the world has for us that we risk missing out on what God has for us. You see, our our nearness problem is really a submission problem, students. And one of the tools he has given us to draw near to him is prayer. It's a time for us to actively submit to him, recognize who he is, be reverent, say, you are the one who can do something. We don't just go to him and ask him for things like he's a genie. God, can you go do this? Students, we have to begin going to him, realizing he is the only one who has the power to do the things that we really need. Maybe you find yourself in a a moment of crisis right now, and like I talked about earlier, you do have that family member who is sick. You do have that family that feels like it's falling apart. You are going through that thing. He is the one who has the power to change it. Have you gone to him in prayer believing that he can actually do that? Students, when we draw near to God in prayer, he draws near to us in presence. 
When we draw near to God in prayer, he draws near to us in presence. Students, we, we go to him not just because he can do things for us, but because he is the one who cares about him enough, cares about us enough to give us what we need, not just what we want. And we have the opportunity to draw near to the very presence of God, the same God who created everything. Have you ever sat and thought about that? The God that created everything that you do know and things you will never know wants to connect with you in a very real way. And I believe some of you can and some of you are missing out on that and getting in your own way because you don't actually have a nearness problem. You have a submission problem. When the rubber meets the road, it's your way over God's way. When you, when you say the words Lord and when you say the words God, you don't actually mean that he's your Lord, that you're under his authority. You don't actually mean that he's your God, that he is reigning, that he is supreme. You, you want to know how you know what you really believe? I, I try to teach this all the time. What you believe determines how you act. So evaluate your actions. Are you acting in a way that he's Lord or that you're Lord? Are you acting in a way that he's in control or that you're in control? Are you acting in a way that he knows what's best or are you acting in a way that you know what's best? And if it really comes down to it, if you want to know that you are actively submitting to him, what happens when you and God disagree? Who's right, you or him? Some of us are getting in our own way and we're saying the nearness of God sounds so good and the nearness of God sounds so great and God can move and God can respond to my prayers. But we're not willing to go to him recognizing who he really is, that he is the one who has the power, that he is the one who is in control. And when you begin to see him rightly, you begin to see yourself rightly in relationship to him. And I believe the most foundational thing for your prayer life, before we get into how to pray and what to pray, you have to realize who you're praying to. That he is God. That there is a time that nothing existed beside him and his very words breathed it all into existence. Maybe your situation or your problem feels daunting. I can't promise you that he's going to fix it the way that you want to. I can't promise that he's going to do it exactly the way you want to. But what I can know, when we go to him, he moves in response to us. I remember when I was a high school student, uh, my senior year, we actually had some tragedy at our high school. We had four students die in car accidents in about the time span of a month. And it just seemed like it happened again, and it happened again, and it happened again. And I remember one day we had an early release day, and uh, I was in weight training. I got to take weight training twice. It was great. Senior year was awesome. And I'm sitting there, and most people aren't even at school, and uh, I'm working out with someone who I usually don't. And we're just working out together, and we're, we're just talking and connecting. And uh, we realized we played on the same, like, uh, little league, like, baseball rec team when we were, like, in elementary school. And we, it was just this beautiful moment when I look back and think about uh, this moment that the Lord gave us. And then a few hours later, I get a text message that he died in a car accident. And I remember trying to, to wrestle with that and wrestle with that and, and wondering, God, I don't know what's going on. Like, why, do you, why, do, why does this keep happening? I don't know. And I remember praying, God, I, I believe I need to be at this funeral. And I, I didn't have a way to get there. I didn't have a car to get there. My parents were both at work. I couldn't find a ride. And I remember uh, getting in the shower and saying, God, I am going to get ready to go. But I, I don't know how I'm going to get there. I remember I just praying, God, you're going to have to do something 
that I can't do for myself, and I take a shower, and I get dressed, and I just begin to wait and think and try and figure this out, and uh, my doorbell rings, and I go to the door, and my, my aunt shows up, who lives in T- Chattanooga, Tennessee, about an hour and a half away, and she was, I, was, I was in the area, and I had some mail I needed to drop off, and she's like, why are you home from school? And so I begin to tell her, hey, we, it's been a crazy month, and uh, there's this funeral today, and I knew I needed to be there, and I didn't know uh, how I was going to get there. And uh, she's like, well, I can take you. And, and as I go back and think that about an hour and a half earlier, I'm sitting in my shower praying that God might do something, and at that same time, God is moving my aunt who lives a state away to be in my area to just drop off some mail unplanned. Didn't even know. And I'm not trying to tell you this story because I did something great and because I did something right. I'm trying to tell you this story because God did something for me when I was where you were at. And he can do it for you too. But it starts not with a nearness problem. It starts with a submission problem. And saying that, God, you are Lord. When you say you're Lord, you mean it. When you say you're in control, you mean it. When you say you have the power, you mean it. And when I pray, that is who I'm praying to. And when you begin praying to him like that, students, I believe you will begin drawing near to him and he will begin drawing near to you and it will change everything for you. Scripture says he'll do it. Pray with me.